Hey everybody, what's going on? Rob Sisterson here with a special edition of Rob Has a Podcast. And we are live here on a Wednesday afternoon to talk to a guy that uh, it's been, what, over a month now uh, since he walked off the Odyssey as the winner of Big Brother Canada 5. Uh, welcome back to the podcast, our great friend, Kevin Martin. That Kevin Martin, yes. Kevin, how are you? Thanks, Rob. I'm good. Yeah, just over a month ago. I think it was 33, 34 days since that Odyssey landed and I got off there. So it's been it's been a crazy ride, but I'm excited to break some break some of the stuff down, the good and the bad of what happened in Big Brother Canada season five. Because it was we won the thing, we won the whole thing, but it wasn't the smoothest ride that we've ever seen <laughs> Not from a Big Brother winner. So I'm excited to break it down. Yes. Okay. All right. And here uh, back with us uh, for the second night in a row. We talked with them last night on part two of our Big Brother 19 season preview. Uh, first is a man uh, who is uh, wearing a poker shirt for uh, Kevin in, uh, in his honor. Here's Alex Kidwell. Alex, how are you? I'm good, Rob. Yeah, I didn't bring that many t-shirts with me when I moved out to LA, but this is one of them. I figured, you know, it was appropriate. It was, uh, it, was, it was the right shirt to put on. And uh, I, I did a little research beforehand because I'm not a big hockey guy. I had to double check this, but the Calgary Flames have not won uh, anything in a long, long time. So I think by default, Kevin Martin, the fighting pride of Calgary at this point. Pride of Calgary. How about that? I like that. Yeah. Okay. It's the first, first time the Big Brother Canada title has ever gone to the West Coast of Canada. I don't know if you guys know Canadian geography. Oh, the huge. East, the East has big won it every time. So finally, the title is out in the West Coast. It's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Representing the Western Conference, Canada. All right, and then here with us, uh, a man who is still uh, west of uh, where he normally is, uh, Taryn Armstrong, live in Vegas. Yeah, Alex may have brought a poker shirt to this uh, podcast, but I traveled all the way to Vegas in honor of uh, Kevin Martin, so I think I haven't beat. He brought the Vegas to Kevin. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, excited to uh, talk with Kevin. Uh, we got a lot of questions uh, from our uh, patron group and also on Twitter this morning, and then we're going to take your questions as well. Hashtag RHAP if you want to weigh in on anything we're going to talk about with Kevin here today. Uh, of course, uh, we're just but one week away from the Big Brother 19 premiere, so lots of excitement uh, going on there if you want to get your hands on some live feeds in anticipation Rob has a website.com slash live feeds is the link for that. Kevin, uh, tell us how has the, how have things been uh, since you came down from the Odyssey? Oh, it's been awesome. Yeah, the love's been overwhelming. It's been it's been interesting now because season six isn't coming back next year. So at the same time, like I won the show, and then there's this uproar of fans being like, no, the show has to come back. So the, the Big Brother Canada community is still kind of in uproar sort of the hiatus. But I mean, it's been awesome. Family was wonderful. As soon as I landed, I went to Mexico for seven days and just sat on a beach. And to sit on a beach and drink a beer and not care about who's winning HOH, not care about who's playing in the veto competition, and just to sit there and relax after three months and decompress. Because, I mean, ugh, the Big Brother is such a psychologically the game really does beat you down and being in there for 69 days. So it's been, it's been awesome and I'm excited to be back in the real world. Now, Kevin, talk to me about the hiatus a little bit, because uh, of course we all know <laughs> that big brother Canada, it was a uh, terrible news, uh, went on hiatus and uh, we don't know what the future is for big brother Canada, but for you, do you kind of want to be the last winner? <laughs> no, that, I mean, you wanted the show to say like, okay, we uh, go out on a high note. That's it. So yeah, I have the, I, I have the belt until season the next season comes back, I guess. So I mean, I want I want it to come back. I would like to see another season for sure. But yeah, I mean, I don't want to retire the champion. I would love to pass it on to another another Canadian somewhere. Have you gotten any updates on uh, your end about anything going on with the efforts to uh, see Big Brother Canada get a renewal? A little bit, like obviously the fan out, out, people went nuts, and thank you to your petition that you signed. It had like what a ton of ton of people signed it and stuff. There's kind of a general optimism. I haven't got any specific details at all, so um, quietly optimistic, but I don't quietly. know anything. Okay, well, thank you for bringing up the petition. Uh, if you uh, are a listener that would like to sign the petition uh, to uh, use the power of veto, whether it's a secret power of veto at this point, uh, I'll uh, leave that to, for you guys to decide. But you can go ahead and uh, reach that. Go to tinyurl.com slash save bbcan. Uh, one of the uh, many efforts going on right now to uh, try to help see Big Brother Canada 
end up uh, coming back into the game and uh, coming back for another season. All right. So, Kevin, uh, did you get a chance to watch any of Big Brother <laughs> Canada 5 yet? Uh, very selfishly, I went and saw clips that were like kind of like my highlights. I haven't seen any of the episodes, but I went and watched like the triple eviction veto win, and then I went and watched the final five HOH win. And then basically, anytime I won a competition, I just went and watched it. And then so I just I just like kind of saw the good parts from my point of view. I haven't seen anything else though. So hopefully this I hopefully don't have too much revisionist history. And what I can say is actually what I saw from the first person's perspective. I have gone on the forums and I've seen people's take on it, but I truly want to give you guys the fresh take of what I thought was going on in that house from the first person perspective. Do you have any desire to go back and watch it? Did no. you enjoy that the first time through? Uh I mean in season three, I think I got a really good edit. I was kind of a super like popular character in season three at the time when I went out and it was really kind of fun to watch because they painted me in such an amazing light. I don't know what happened. I, I don't know, you know, kind of what edit or how it was perceived this time. Um, but no, I have no desire to go back for a while. We won. Let's just sit on it. And I, yeah, I mean, maybe when I'm in a couple years, but I have no immediate desire. What have you found is the biggest misconception uh, that people have about your game in talking with people and reading uh, things online? <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the final five decision is probably a massive decision where I win the final five HOH and I win the final five veto. I take Ica off the block. Dylan goes up. Dylan goes home. On paper, it looks like a disaster and people just lost their mind. But from my point of view, there's a lot of different You situations. have no idea, Kevin. What's that? Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, and Taryn and I were actually in the crowd for Dylan's eviction. That was when we were in Toronto for yeah, our nice. show. So we were, we were there. <laughs> We, uh, we're right there. Yeah. Very close, that, so far away. That decision, whether you want to label it as a mistake based on the information that was in the house at the time. Um, but people, people are, it's interesting. They say we're break up Ike and Dimitri. The, the fact that there, the social relationships in the house didn't matter at that point. I had to win the final four veto. I needed to play against the weakest competitors in that final four veto competition. Obviously the perfect lineup was, and we can go to that decision more as we break through the game, but yeah. Oh, hey, Peely, say hi. <laughs> oh, you can't hear that with the headphones. Yeah. Okay. She waved. She waved for people yeah. that are uh, listening to the audio version. Okay. Uh, Kevin, just uh, let, let's uh, uh, just go back to the beginning uh, real quick. And just uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, when you found out that there was going to be an all-star version of uh, Big Brother and uh, whether there was any hesitation on your part to go back and do this? Uh, for sure. So... Uh, the first time when you get cast on Big Brother Canada, the casting process is like six, six, seven months. It's very long. It's almost part of the game. This time, they phoned me about two and a half weeks before the show started. I think it was 15, 16 days. And they said, do you have any general interest? And I said, yes. I thought about it for one day. I was at a really good spot in my life with my poker career. Mentally, physically, I was in like a really good moment. So I did have to think about it. But within 20 minutes, I was like, of course, I have to go play again. I mean, the, the way I went out in season three, the triple eviction and uh, it, it never sat with me quite correctly and I had a second shot at redemption. I had to go back whether I was going to fail or succeed. It's like uh, I had to go try again. So I took about 20 minutes and said yes and then immediately I put my life on stop and I had 15 days to prepare before I was taken away for sequester. So not much time at all. But I did try to prepare as much as possible in those last 15 days. So if you follow my Twitch, I mean, the rumor, people in the community basically knew I was going back because I was putting out a YouTube video every day with my poker content. I was Twitch streaming all the time. And then all of a sudden, I hard stopped it. And I didn't really have a reason. I think I tweeted about going to visit my family somewhere or something. And everyone just cried wolf. And they're like, this kid's on Big Brother Canada 5. I tried to downplay it as much as possible. I was super worried that, you know, that would hurt my chances to get on. But thankfully, it didn't. And then, yeah, we went and, we went and played nine days of sequester. And then they put me in the house. So was there a lot of chatter of people like blowing up your phone to want to talk to you uh, in the pregame, uh, whether or not they were actually even on the season? Yeah, the old trip to yeah. grandma's house, eh? <laughs> Fool me once. <laughs> there was, um, I actually, the only two people I really had suspicion of going back was Cindy and Netta. Besides that, the other people kept it pretty clean. And I mean, they didn't, there was really no phone calls at all. But it was just sufficient based on social media activity and stuff. I did, I did my research. Everyone else was a, like a complete su surprise to me. So no, people, at least for, to me, I didn't get a lot of people reaching out at all. 
Uh, so not even Bruno, who you went no, in? No, I had no idea. That's that's one of the craziest things. Because Bruno and I were not even really close. We didn't get along in season three. We texted each other once in a while, um, played video games one time, but I wouldn't say that we were like close friends at all. No, he kept it on the down low and yeah, didn't know about Bruno at all. And when you finally got into the house, uh, were you surprised that it was only a half All-Stars? Well, that's the first time they've ever done that format, right? We've seen like four returning right. players. Uh, we've never seen half and half. I was I was pretty shocked. I thought maybe four returning players. Um, but yeah, or maybe full All-Stars. But half and half was uh, definitely a surprise. But I, I was really excited because in the history on Survivor and Big Brother, returning players have always had the edge. As we saw in Season 5, I mean, we kind of were a hot mess as we went after each other and stuff. But I thought the fact that there was eight returning players and eight new players really benefited, benefited me and gave me an edge in the game because returning players in that half and half mix on Survivor and Big Brother have never uh, have never have always kind of found the victory with the Cochrane and and you know so yeah. So in terms of the early stages of the game, there was a lot of the <coughs> vets going after the vets. And of course, you know, the first week was, you know, uh, Mark versus Dimitri's and, and nobody had any idea that Dimitri yeah. was such a big uh, part of the season. But from that point on, <coughs> it was a lot of the uh, returning players targeting the returning players, which we've never really seen happen before. Could you just talk through what was going through your mind uh, at that point? Yeah, it was a complete disaster, right? <laughs> so I walk in day one, and I'm super happy because we have eight returning players, eight new players. Basically, in Big Brother, that's almost like a pre-made alliance because we have met each other in the outside world. We have communicated whether we're best friends or not. Some, like I'd, I'd never talked to Cassandra. I'd never talked to Gary. There's a lot of people I'd never talked with. But just the fact that we were bonded, that this is our second time, I was like, this is a pre-made alliance. We can band together. We have experience. We can make sure that we one of us can win this game then karen wins hoh on day one my worst fear is That's that a right, kevin <laughs> deal with it <laughs> it was my worst so we walk out there day one for the hoh and it's an endurance challenge and immediately i'm terrified because i can't really compete and in endurance challenges it's like i'm terrible so a female new player wins and this is the worst case situation because i know that two vets are definitely on the chopping block. And if they're going to take a shot at two vets, why not take a shot at Kevin and Bruno? These are two guys who played on the same season and people paired us together immediately. So Time I to go work. big buck hunting. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, credit to Netta, Aika, and Cindy that first week, that first couple of days, they really befriended Karen and made sure that the nominations fell on the new player side. So a new player wins HOH and two new players are on the block. Like It's an amazing situation for the veterans. At this point, we should really run over this game. Um, and then it just fell apart after day six, seven, eight, kind of in there. Yo, what was it I, like? I mean, when you're, you, you're trying to micromanage Netta and Ika and, and that relationship's just clearly slipping through everyone's fingers because they just can't seem to get on the same page ever. Oh yeah. I never, I never tried to micromanage any relationships because <laughs> I knew out of all the personalities in there, if you rate it from the most explosive to the least explosive, I was either the bottom or near the bottom in terms of just a chill. I'm a very mellow person and very passive person. And that kind of hurt me in certain moments in the game, but oh my God. Yeah. I, I, I forget exactly what day it was, but there was this big battle between Netta's people and Ika's people, and it was brewing a couple weeks in the game. And on Netta's side was me and Bruno, and then on Ika's side was Dre, William, and it was just this huge battle, and it blew up during the double eviction. I didn't think it would blow up that soon, but, I mean, it made for some epic television, right? Yeah, it yeah, certainly it, did. Uh, Jordan, Jordan was talking to me about uh, that, like, when he was talking to you preseason, he was saying that you were really for working on uh, trying to figure out how to like maintain close, genuine relationships with people because that's yes. something that you kind of struggled yeah. with on Big Brother Canada 3. Uh, what kind of like preparation work did you put in to try to make sure you were going to do okay with that? And like, how did you think you were doing in the early uh, season? Uh, I mean, my social game was all my weakest thing in season three. And in season five, it was also, uh, I don't know. I just, I, in my, it's, when I form bonds, I have a close inner circle in my real life. And same in the Big Brother house. When I phone Bruno and Netta, I would have, we were so, so close in that house. But when you get to the outer circle, I just struggled for some reason. My preparation in the pregame, I read a, I read a, I read a couple self-help books about, um, I forget what the title was. It's a, it's a popular one. Like, I think Cass read it. Remember on Survivor? It's How like, to win friends and influence people. Yes. <laughs> I read the first half of that in Sequester. How to win friends and influence people. I took a page from Chaos Cass. Jordan actually gave me that book pregame. Jordan was like a really good help. He, I know you're not supposed to tell anyone that you're going back to Big Brother, but I definitely told Jordan and he helped me with a lot of prep. 
Yeah. So I read that book and 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 hopefully learned some social skills. And I mean, it, it kind of worked. Like people, like I kind of skated by the first half of the game in a lot of situations. It was really crazy. Neta was almost. I talked about meat shields going into the this season. If if there's not if there's no targets ahead of you in Survivor and Big Brother, then like you're you're kind of doing something wrong. I thought. And in a weird way, I I always pictured like a Mark or Dimitri being my meat shield, but Neta was my meat shield for some reason. People viewed Netta as the leader, which she definitely was. She did most of the strategical talking. She's, I, I still think she's a really great player, even though the season didn't work out for her. So I knew that Netta was targeted ahead of Bruno and myself, which is like Bruno and I should be the targets in terms of physical and mental ability in competitions. Like you got to take a shot at Kevin and Bruno, in my opinion, but they kept going after Netta. So when Netta left on the double eviction, it was pretty devastating for my game because me and Bruno were next in line. Yeah, before we get to that double eviction, uh, one thing that, you know, I think it was a really big factor in the season as a whole in Netta's game, but it was so early that people kind of forget about it. That whole, the time warp twist and yeah. the fact that Netta got like 21% of the vote and you were second with 17. Like how, how do you think that impacted Netta's game? Like, do you think that hurt her? And how do you think it would have factored in if you had been the one that actually won that? Yeah. Um, so that was day six. I just, me and Bruno tried to flip the Mark vote and we, we were on, Bruno and I were on the wrong side of the vote. We tried to save Mark. We fell one vote show, which was just, a. you guys didn't get live feeds that first week and God damn, like it was just the most insane. We were, I like, I play, I talked more game in the first six days of Big Brother Canada than I did all of season three. It was unbelievable how crazy that first week was. So that, yeah, I didn't think I would get that high, but thank you to everyone who su was supporting me. Well, you can debate whether the immunity curse is a good thing, like a plus EV thing for your game. Does getting immunity for the pre-jury increase your chance to win the game or does it hurt your chance? That's a debate. I mean, in this case, it didn't work with Netta, but I actually think it might still be a positive thing. I don't want to be results orientated. I, I mean, I would have loved the immunity to get to, to jury and just sat back. Credit to Netta. She won two competitions while immune. I don't know if that was the best strategical decision. She definitely could have laid more low-informed personal relationships. But Netta just plays as a big brother at 100%. She, she, I think, played too hard while she was immune. You know, she's targeting mm -hmm. cash. She's calling people out. She's making fun at speeches. With immunity, like, that's going to rub people the wrong way. Were you thinking that during the time it was happening or it's sort of like upon reflection that, yeah, she probably was doing that too hard because we were talking about it uh, as the show was going on that it seemed like that uh, things were trending in a bad direction for her. Yeah. I mean, a little bit, obviously in reflection, you can see that it just it climaxed to a disaster. But while it was going on, I definitely saw that Ica was, it was rubbing Ica and Cassandra Gary the wrong way. But I was actually kind of a fan of it because I really tried to point Netta as my leader and her being that meat shield ahead of me. I liked that the attention was on her and not myself and Bruno. Uh, something that I think uh, I really want to know, especially from the early season was, uh, do you know what happened with, with um, uh with karen like oh do, yeah do, do why did she hate you the entire season <laughs> uh the first week i think so karen was hoh on and it was uh <laughs> karen was a hilarious hoh she i mean credit to her she's great television getting to the final four or final three kind of bonds people karen and i are on good terms now anyway but um she's she's kind of a cool lady but it took me a while to find that out <laughs> um so the first week, Karen grabbed me, and she looked me in the eye and said, swear to me that you're voting out Mark. She wanted Dimitri to stay really badly. She just looked me in the eye and said, swear to me, and pinned up in a corner in the bathroom. I said, okay, Karen, I swear to you. And then me and Drew Bruno tried to flip the vote. So going against her HOH, Karen blacklisted me. She was like, this kid can never be trusted. And when you go against Karen and Big Brother, Karen puts you on the blacklist pretty harshly. But it was just that, and then multiply it with just a personality conflict. We didn't have anything in common. Um, and it was just, it just, I became a monster in her head and it, the Karen Kevin storyline, I haven't seen the show still, but I want to see how it's portrayed on television because it was, it was bad in there, but also for strategic reasons, I didn't think it was that bad. Having a name target in big brother can kind of put other people's mind at ease. So if I'm going to have an enemy in the house, I was really glad it was Karen because her chances of winning an HOH are on the low side. So, I mean, I, I definitely kind of, uh, never could fix that that bond with Karen ever. So uh, I want to know uh, a little bit more about, uh, did you try to 
ever really go out of your way to fix the issues with Karen in terms of trying to uh, just sort of smooth things over or you were just uh, fine you weren't uh, too concerned with her? I did it one time. I think it was day 12 or day 13. I grabbed her and said, Karen, we have to fix something. We have to fix something. We had like a 15-minute chat. But within that conversation, she got the message that I was going after her. And that was like totally not the way I wanted the conversation to go. So I had this 15-minute conversation of like, Karen, we need to work on a relationship. Let's spend time together. Let's be honest with each other. We can become, we don't have to go after each other in this game. But apparently a couple of my sentences, she, she thought I was trying to intimidate her. So that it, it, I tried to fix it and it got even worse. And at that point, well, like if I'm going to have a name target in this house, let it be Karen. Because the Karen, everyone was aware of the Karen and Kevin dynamic, and it did, it definitely did people put people's brain at ease, knowing that if I did win a challenge, I was going to go after Karen. If I did win an HOH in those early weeks, I was never ever going to go after Karen. But I definitely wanted people to think that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think something that I think bonds a lot of like real big fans of these kinds of shows is that generally, at least from my perspective, we tend to be very logical people. And I think, you know, I, I would really, at least me personally, I would really like to know, like, how do you cope with what at least on the surface seems like irrational, illogical play from the people around you in a game like this? Like when you can objectively seemingly see that someone's not making a decision that's going to uh, help them win money. Like, how do you yeah. not let that consume you? And keep you for like, how do you keep your head in the game when that's going on around you? Um, and the biggest instance of that at, at the final five, it was four versus one. You know, it was Demika, Karen, and Dylan. They all wanted me out so badly. It was four versus one. Not only was it four versus one, people in the four were willing to sacrifice their own game and make bad decisions to get me out. Like the vengeance from Karen was so real. It was crazy. So yeah, Karen admitted, she, Karen admitted multiple times that she was making bad game moves just to spite me and try to get me out. So it's tough. It's like when you play a poker tournament, you assume everyone's trying to make as much money as they can. And when you play Big Brother, I assume the same thing, but people are there for other objectives, whether to make good television and stuff. So yeah, to try to play a game in a system where people aren't going to make logical decisions or even try to make logical decisions, that's what made it really, really tough. So I want to uh, discuss a little bit about the relationship you fostered in the house with William, which ultimately mm -hmm. ends up saving your game completely at the point where he ends up with those two vetoes, takes you down off the block, and that's really the turning point for you where you never end up looking back. So how early on were you looking at him as somebody who was going to potentially play that role for you in a game? Uh, I think it was just after the first week. I mean, we kind of always got along the first the first week and a half, but I was pretty aware of that there were this, the house was pretty divided and that it was like Netta, Bruno, myself, Dylan, Emily. We had that blue room, right? And I needed another friend on the outside, other side of the house for information and you know just a just a friend on that side. And I chose it to be willing. We just had a connection. We had fun flirting with each other all the time. Um, and yeah, we really enjoyed each other's presence and a lot in big brother. I feel like it comes down to who you can have fun with and just enjoy on a human level. There's so much downtime in there. There's so much boredom and William just made me laugh and he was super funny. We formed a really good genuine connection, but for game reasons, it was really good because I was really secure with my blue side of the house and I had that person on the other side of the house. I was never his number one over Dre, but that was fine. He still passed me information. And then obviously that week when I was up against Bruno, he saved me with the secret power of veto. Would William have used the, remember he won in the 100 minutes of heaven, the counting competition. Would he have used the real veto if he didn't have the secret power veto? He claims that he would have. It's too bad we didn't get to see that in action. It would have been sexy if William would have used the secret power on me and then put the real veto around Bruno's neck. That would have been a super sexy play, but it's too bad it didn't happen. I was advocating for that all yeah. week. I was like, this is what he should be doing. And I really do think that was the best move for his game. I mean, obviously he goes out pretty soon after that. Uh, I think that wouldn't have happened if Bruno was still in the house. Right, no, I recall we were talking about it and it's like, uh, it's the old half measure, right? Like if you're gonna make the move to save Kevin, you go all the way or you don't make it. But yeah, what he did was kind of the 50% move there. Yeah. And so uh, how has uh, William been since the show? Are you guys still on good terms? That it didn't oh, yeah. feel like that? Because there was a lot of times when you were saying in the diary room, look, 
William is a nice guy, but I am, this is a, a game move for me. I'm not really considering his feelings. Was there any sort of animosity uh, after he got to watch those clips? No, a lot. Of, I got a lot of hate after the show and during the show for the William relationship. People saw me kind of as a game bot and that I was using this this young guy's emotions to to put myself farther in the game. But that's what Big Brother is about. You form relationships with other people and then use those relationships to progress yourself. Like I didn't understand. I don't think I did anything malicious at all or I never tried to – you know, make him a huge fool with this relationship. We're on great terms. He's he, he came out of the house and he's like, why are people so upset for me? That's what he said. He didn't understand why people in the community were upset for him because he was using, he was going to use my relationship to further him. It was the same back and forth. And, and so, I mean, we're great. We text all the time with Snapchat. There was no animosity at all. And um, I thought he was hilarious. I can't wait to watch how he was on the show. Yeah, uh, there was... Yeah, I, I think that's one of the... Um... I think that's one of the uh, the uh, the things that, like, in terms of the edit, they really did portray. It was weird because you you usually get like a very good edit, and I do think that you did get a good edit in this season. Like, I think one of the moments was when William was trying to trick you into using the VO, uh, yes. and then you know, Ika eventually tells you this is a trap. They're gonna nominate Bruno. Uh, they didn't t they didn't show that Ika told you that. They just showed you being like, I have a bad feeling about this. Oh, that's uh, I'm not gonna cool, do yeah. it. Like. <laughs> Right, uh, <laughs> uh, but they also showed you uh, in a in a really like weirdly negative light with William, where it just seemed like it seemed like from the edit that you were just playing him the whole time, which was really confusing a lot of people because I know on the feeds you were always talking about like no, I I genuinely like William, um, but I do think it came off uh, in a different light uh, through the edit. Yeah. yeah, and we certainly got a lot of mileage out of a DR clip of Williams in that moment where it's like, Kevin, I'm going to trick you, you little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a great cast. Yeah, it is a really good cast. No, nothing, nothing was malicious at all. I just, I really genuinely really like that kid. And like, outside of Netta and Bruno, I mean, he was always in my best considerations, especially when Netta gets knocked off, when, when Cindy gets knocked off. He was all, he was always at my number two. And I really wanted to see him go far. But I mean, I wanted to see myself win more than anyone else. And I think that's what Big Brother is all about. So I didn't really understand the uproar of certain people. Um, and I, William didn't understand it either. It was just like, we were really close friends and we really still like each other. So in the lead up to when Netta is going to end up going out, yeah. the six is going <clears throat> along. It feels like that the six is strong. Did you have any sort of a sense that there was going to be this split coming in the six? Oh, yeah. The six was not going strong for very long. It was, again, <clears throat> this kind of this fight between Ned and Ike was brewing and you could just see it from I said with the conversations people were having and and Ned had tried to rally Cindy over but Ike could grab Cindy Cindy really loved Ike Cindy just looked up to Ike and and uh, just would have never gone against her at that moment so yeah that fight was coming I didn't think it would happen on day 34 with the double eviction but um, it sure did and I, it was just crazy to watch and I mean that was just like a, I won the game you can win a poker tournament, but you can look back and you can you can play poker hands badly. And like on day thirty four, when I passively went up to Cindy and said like eh, like don't put up Netta, like you shouldn't do this, but it's your decision. Like I should have just grabbed her and said, don't you dare do this. Like don't you even think about it. And I think Bruno regrets that as well. Is like for Cindy to win H O H and for Netta to be the backdoor plan is just a huge detriment on our game that we couldn't stop. That we should have been more aggressive. But during a double eviction, things are so crazy. There's chaos going on. It's really tough to t kick it into the high gear and take action when you need to. But when you yeah, knew I mean, that the six was going uh, the wrong way, did you and Bruno have a contingency plan about what you were planning to potentially do to get out of uh, what was going to be a sinking ship? Yeah, I mean. Our contingency plan was that Netta was going to go ahead of us, and then after Netta was going to leave, that we would have to beast out and that, that we would have to go crazy. And we tried to foster a relationship with Dylan. That, unfortunately, didn't work out when I won the brick challenge and didn't use the veto on him. That really, really hurt Dylan, and that relationship could never be spared. And during that time, also selfishly, like I was with Bruno, but during that time, I also was working on my relationship with Ike and Dimitri a lot, so that if Netta went, then Bruno would be the target ahead of me. And I think I was successful. They didn't trust Bruno as much as they trusted me. So I was kind of working things. I mean, I was with Bruno, but at the same time, you're always trying to develop relationships with, with other people. So our plan was to ride Netta, you know, go with Netta as long as we could. And then uh, if she was taken out, then we would have to kind of beast and go for it. 
yeah, ultimately, I mean, that double is just so uh, so detrimental to your game in so many ways. I mean, not just that you lose your shield in Neta, but, you know, Jackie wins that veto and is looking around like, why is nobody happy for me? Yeah. And it's just, there were so many elements of the social dynamic that got just kind of screwed up by Cindy revealed, not yeah. knowing what to do once she won that power there. Yeah, it's really upsetting. And if you yeah. look back at the tiebreaker when we answer those questions, I do believe, I haven't talked to Cindy about the game, but I think Cindy tried to throw the competition. She answered 22 dodgeballs. And I we wondered about that. What's that? We did wonder about that. I think time. she must have tried to throw it. And then I answered incorrectly. It was just a disaster. If I won the power, it would have been different. But it was it was really unfortunate. And again, a huge detriment to, to Bruno and Maya's game. That Oh, Bruno and I, I mean, we la there's clips of us laughing about it. We just like... We just lack so much control in certain moments, which is unfortunate. Like think like Cindy wins the HOH and Netta goes home. Like, how do we allow that to happen? <laughs> Next week, Dylan wins the HOH. Dylan's supposed to be our boy. You know, we've been talking to this guy about boxing for a month. We've just been pumping this guy up. We did have a really, really close bond with with uh, with Dylan. Dylan wins HOH and Cindy goes home. Like our people were winning HOH and our people were going home. And then it was just yeah, it was really unfortunate. There was yep. one scene we where did... oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, we, I just, we did find it very amusing that uh, Cindy, uh, with like two disastrous moves, was like the total catastrophe in your game in both Big Brother Canada 3 and Big Brother Canada 5. <laughs> yeah. What's, do you know, I don't know if this came across on the show at all. Uh, this is kind of like a little behind the scenes is when you're sitting in that living room and you're talking to Arissa, often with her microphone, you can see the audience reaction. You can see their faces. You can see them either cheering or booing. And we were aware that Netta was the villain of the season because Arissa goes, and Netta, your immunity is up this week. And Canada lost it. Ah, they started cheering so aggressively, like they wanted her blood. We were super aware of that Netta was the villain based on the crowd reactions. I think it played into Cindy's decision for sure. That, you know, like there's, there's, yeah, there was, they need a vacuum seal that house because we, we definitely got some information in there based on Canada reacting during the live shows. And I think it was a massive, reason why Cindy put Netta up as the back door as well. Did you guys know that from earlier competitions during the season? Because uh, around the time that Gary was going out of the house, that there was, uh, that was like the first time that there was some sort of like a pop when ne uh, Netta did badly in uh, the challenge. And there was a scene between Netta and uh, Gary where uh, he, they, they were discussing you know, uh, who is the, you know, the bad guy on the season? Like, uh, who, is, who is the person that the audience is rooting for? Yeah, I think that was day 27. That's the HOH that William won. Yeah, so they, the, you don't have to remember all this stuff anymore. Dude, I, looked at those <laughs> well, I, looked at those I looked at those sprinkles for hours and hours. I don't think I can ever forget the days. Oh, my God. Anyway, so I think it was, yeah, I think it was the William HOH. And in those booth competitions, whenever people get eliminated, like let's say Alex and I get eliminated together, Canada would cheer or whatever, you can't really tell. But Netta got eliminated as a singular unit and Canada lost it. So Netta answers, Netta, you're eliminated from the competition. Again, Canada, woo, like cheering at Netta's elimination. That's one of the first moments where like, okay, like she is not loved by Canada. And I think it, like, I mean, look at look at Cindy. Cindy came off of season three and she was kind of a polarized character. She did get some love, but she wasn't, she, she didn't get a ton of, you know, love in certain moments either. And I think that played into her mindset of that she almost wanted to play with Canada. She wanted to be on the right side with Canada this time. I, I, I do think that decision to put up Netta did impact based on Canada's cheers. How about Netta? Have you been in contact with her since the end of the season? How has she been doing now that she's been able to uh, get away from this season? She's been really good. I think I think it hit her hard. And I, Peely and I got day drunk with her the other day, and we had some good talks. It, it hit her hard. I mean, she was such a beloved character. She, I mean, in all of your guys' podcasts, Netta's ranked number one. Number one to come back, number one strategist ever. She was ranked in such high regards based off her game in season two. And then to come back and kind of get turned into the villain and then get eliminated when after her immunity is up. Like, it, it really did hit her hard, but I think she's doing all right. She's probably going to move to Toronto and do some fashion stuff. And I just, you know, I, I, I wish the best for her. We did really get along in that game, and we were very closely aligned. It was kind of hard to see her go out that drastically.
I want to ask you about Ica as well. So how much did you personally uh, underestimate her, if at all, coming into this season? Because I didn't think that the game that she played in the season, I didn't think she had it in her. I remember talking to her in the preseason, and she was basically saying, like, uh, you know, I, I was like, hey, are you going to rip up the letters again? She's like, yeah, I'll probably do it. Uh, and I was like, okay, that's such a, a good idea. Maybe, you know, don't be uh, so crazy this time. But she was phenomenal. Did you have a certain impression of her going in that was ended up being different than what she was able to do? No, I had a similar impression as you. Entertaining character, but lacked in strategical and social ability. And uh, she definitely proved me wrong. I definitely underestimated her. But it, pretty quickly, we were aware that like this girl actually has some major potential. After like that double eviction was her coming out party. I was like, wow, I could got Cindy to backdoor Netta. Like Cindy won the HOH, Netta leaves. Everyone in the house was like, that was Ika's move. Like, Ika did that. And, yeah, she definitely – she played a fantastic game. Very tough to live with at moments. Again, like, I respect her game a lot. But when you're on Ika's bad side, it, in locked in that environment, when you're on – credit to Ika. When you're on Ika's good side, when you're with her in the game, you feel like you're her best friend. She looks at you. She makes eye contact. Let's do this, Kevin. Let's do this. And there were moments where I was on Ika's side, and I just felt like the most loved person in the house ever. But when I'm on your bad side, it was it was kind of brutal. So, yeah, she played an awesome game. But, I mean, if you can't win competitions at the end, based on how the Canadian format is set up, you're going to – like we saw that in Cassandra in Season 4. Amazing game. But can't win those final competitions. But I think that that's why you two are so interesting because I feel like you're almost uh, complete opposites as players. Both really great players, but your superpowers are almost exactly identical in terms of that, you know, her strengths are really being able to go in form these emotional bonds with players, mm -hmm. but she can't win anything. Uh, you are uh, more likely to uh, win people over with a strategic argument. And uh, then, uh, as we saw in this season, that you're going to be able to rely on your uh, challenge acumen as well. It's just a, a really interesting dynamic between both you and her. Oh, yeah. When you're in the lab making a Big Brother player, like if you're crafting an Ica, it's very different than the recipe that crafts a Kevin. Like it's totally two different players and both had – success in different ways you know yeah yeah i mean do you really do you credit ico with because a lot of fans were wondering especially like in the middle of the game there like why couldn't you know dre really wants to work with william kevin really wants to work with william why can't dre and kevin ever get on the same page and do you really uh, feel like it was ico's social work with dre that really was the big factor there or was i mean was it just that dre never really was able to trust you i mean what do you think was the big it was it was uh, a little bit of ika in there doing some work but no it was mostly basically between me and dre there's just no there's no again nothing in common no chemistry strategically the entire game after you're playing 40 days of big brother together and you haven't made a single decision together it's like it's hard to pick up the pieces good players can and i just didn't have that gear to connect with dre again i didn't have a connection with karen with dre there was a lot of people that i just for some reason couldn't break down the barrier and i don't know what it was so yeah dre dre and i that, that, i don't really think ika was involved in that but dre and i were never on the same page this season unfortunately which is weird because william and i were close william and william again that's kind of a detriment on william that he could never bridge us together to form a stronger group to work together it's too bad i, I think Dre's yeah. hilarious <laughs> well, something I, I think we kind of noted a along as the season went was that um, for whatever reason, anybody that was really mean to you, like you were the nicest to them, like you really went out of your way to be as nice and honest as possible with the people yeah. that were like really coming at you. Um, and we like I found that particularly very interesting because like I think I understood where you were coming from in terms of like when you're playing Big Brother, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, well, this person doesn't like me, therefore I can't work with them. I think you really went out of your way to try to work with them but it often kind of backfired where like they were like why is kevin not mad at me why is he being so sketchy um and it, i think it really kind of uh you know impacted the way that people saw you and, and maybe was one of the limiting factors in terms of being able to make those social bonds like what do you what do you think about that do you think i'm on uh no, that's, like on that's, something that's bang, that's bang on is like when someone was uh went against me in the game or personal or whatever i would go to them and just say and and be overly nice, you know, because I never had to do that with Bruno. I never had to be overly nice with Bruno. We had it. We were just with each other the entire time. But with Ika, with Karen, with Dre, whenever we weren't again, I would go to them and be honest and try to be vulnerable and stuff. And it often did backfire. Like this is very strange. And you know, people were expecting. There's when Ika's yelling me at the final five, like your game can't stand up to mine. I'm sitting there just dipping my tea bag. Like that's how I react to conflict in my real life. I just don't give it back. I'm just not a conflict person. And yeah, I. 
well, it's kind of like, you know, remember Adam Klein, like he would blind someone, go up and give them those hard truths. I tried to emulate a little bit of Adam Klein's strategy. It's like, yeah, I voted against you, but this is why. Let's please work together in the future. And uh, I was just playing a different game than a lot of people who were in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that that was a really good. Uh, the, the Taron had really uh, nailed that during uh, the season. I thought that was a really interesting way that you, uh, you know, uh, with and one, of, one of the reasons why it seemed like at times it was a struggle for people like uh, to have a lot of trust in you where uh, it was sometimes like the people that were your allies who would get burned, but you'd be trying to reach out and form bonds with people who you had had disagreements with, but they were, they felt uncomfortable with you because uh, you know, of uh, the past stuff. And then the people outside of Bruno who you had been working with and had had productive relationships with also ended up feeling like there was some mistrust. Yeah, absolutely. Like with Dylan and I didn't, Dylan and Emily were on the block. I won the veto at the brick challenge. Whether I should have thrown that veto or not was something I debated for a long time. And then I didn't use the veto because Bruno was going to be at the back door. Like that burned that relationship. Dylan, Emily and I were so good for so long. And it was just so unfortunate. And then, yeah, with, there's always instances people could look back on where I, where I did shady things. To be honest, I mean, I kind of, I was shady. I would go lie and create alliances and stuff. And people just, I just couldn't trust me in a lot of moments, but thank goodness for those end comp wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, like, sorry, like conversely, um, you know, I think this, this hurt you in the house, but I think it was one of the bigger, I mean, obviously you're up next to Karen in the end, but I think it was one of the bigger factors in terms of being able to get a unanimous jury vote was that, you were nice to the people that didn't like you. And so they were, they didn't have anything that they could use to say, well, Kevin is the worst other than Karen, obviously yeah. nobody could say Kevin is the worst. We hate him. We would never vote for him. Yeah. People use the word social game and it's a very broad thing. Like I don't really understand what that, what is this? Like I was very nice to people and it definitely played into the nine zero jury vote at the end. I was always nice to people, whether social game means that you can't work people strategically or you're just nice to them. I'm not sure, but you're right. I was always nice to people. I never slandered people. And big brother people often very talk, talk, you know, shit about each other in different rooms behind closed doors. I, n I never really engaged in that very much. That's just kind of who I am in the, in the real world as well. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I admire about you is that while, you know, you will make just about any move to any person in the game that, there, there's not a mean spiritedness uh, no. about it where it's not coming from a place of that you hate somebody. It's just that you are trying to uh, make that game move. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you, this one is your friend, you know, you, you know, you may screw somebody over. But I, I always like that you've taken uh, the higher road in terms of uh, never like going after the personal attacks with people. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. I mean, like, I could, I could play it an awesome game, but in terms of, like, if you were against her in the game, she would attack you on a personal level. Like, she would go after your, your edges or whatever. <laughs> she, she, and, yeah, I never did that. Like, let's go against each other in a game perspective, but let's not attack the personal stuff. I, I never... But as a TV that. viewer, I like that also. I was going to say, it's a good thing oh, she yeah. never found Kevin's study guide. Uh, I, th I think what some they would always mess with my sprinkle because at the end during that final two weeks I was just open with it I'm just like I yeah. just kind of left it though right, right yeah. uh, on another note, interesting uh, Rob Bruno and I had a talk after the show and we discussed if we went farther in the game together what would have happened Bruno says he would have taken me to the end and trying to beat me in the final two I openly admitted I was like Bruno I was going to cut you at the final five final four because you're too good of a mental competitor like you're one person that could have gave me a run for the money in the mental competitions so I would have cut Bruno again not in a mean-spirited way at all but yeah so that's something I think a lot of like that's definitely you know leads to a question I want to know and I, I know I've seen a lot of people ask is like you know it wasn't, you know, the timing obviously doesn't work out well for you when Netta goes at the double eviction there. But if Netta doesn't go there, at some point, like, that is kind of a big obstacle. Like, if the six manages to survive, like, how do you yeah. get rid of Netta yourself if somebody doesn't, you know, remove that giant peg from the board for you? You're right. If Netta survives, eventually the triangle of Netta, Kevin, Bruno would have had to turn after each other. And how that would have went, we'll never see. But... Again, as the game gets deeper, those mental competitions become more important. And while Ned is a good mental competitor, I was more scared of Bruno at the final five, final four than Netta. Um, so yeah, it would have been interesting. Wouldn't Bruno and I have taken a shot at Netta? Not for a while, not till final seven, final six. We had to go after Dre first. We had to go after, you know, potentially William first. There was other people on the list. 
care like I Neta, oh, excuse me, Neta was too close of an ally to me at that moment to consider it. But the war would have happened. That would have been interesting. But I think the Ica versus Neta war turned out to be better television anyway. Like the Kevin Bruno Neta war wouldn't have been as interesting. Would have been a little bit more of like uh, like a political type uh, drama yeah. as opposed to like a <laughs> the, knockdown drag yeah. out fight. <laughs> House exactly. of Cards versus Game of Thrones. Yeah. Right. I mean, again, credit to Ica. Look at season two of Big Brother Canon and season five. She's kind of one of the main common to know. That lady makes great television. She does. While it's hard to live with sometimes, she makes an amazing show. Yeah. The rivalry that you ended up having with Dimitri, uh, I thought was uh, really, really fun to watch how that played out where you guys went back and forth. Uh, I, I don't think we've really had anything like that before on Big Brother. I mean, how much pressure was there knowing that you were going to be facing Dimitri in all of these competitions coming down the stretch with your game on the line? Oh, yeah. Every single time I went out there and I had to beat Dimitri. We just I, – like. It was like a month since anyone else won a competition besides me and Dimitri. We just traded back and forth. When I was sitting out of the HOH, he won. Like, he was an absolute fantastic competitor. And it's crazy that it came down to me and him in that final trivia game as well with the A and Bs. Like, I don't know. It was just wild. We just threw shots at each other the entire season. He won HOH. I would win veto to save myself. I would win HOH. He would win veto. Back and forth, back and forth. And it's kind of cool that it did come to that final part three of the HOH to finally decide the decision. But you're right. Going out and playing in every competition, my biggest worry was Dimitri every single time. In terms of that final competition, though, knowing that it was going to be trivia, and yeah. with all due respect to Dimitri, who was great in so many different competitions, that's really your forte. I mean, yeah. you had to have known going in that you had a big leg up on him in that competition. Did you feel really confident heading to that uh, third part? Um. Yes, but at the same time, it's 50-50. There is some variance. I definitely felt like I had the edge, maybe like I was going to win that 70% of the time, 75% of the time. I don't know. I definitely felt like there is an edge. Um, funny, it was funny. Um, so you know how that – this is like a little behind the scenes that I thought was hilarious. So I studied every second of free time I got. I feel like I've studied more than – I truly kind of just st – took study into an obsessive level like no one ever has potentially. <laughs> um, so we go out into that backyard. We're doing rehearsal for the part three of the HOH. We're each and standing in front of our buzzers. Production comes on and says, all right, guys, you're going to be answering questions about the jury. And instantly my mind flips to the U.S. version. How they, You know how they answer those jury questions like the jury members say area B, and that's more of a flip. That's just random stuff. So instantly I panic. I'm just like, no, I studied for weeks. My edge is gone, right? Now it's a flip situation. But then during the real thing, we go out there, and I realized it was trivia questions about the jury. And so then I was like, okay, thank God, it's actually trivia. Um, so that was a little cool behind the scenes that I thought was pretty funny. But you're right. So we're answering there. As soon as I buzz in, and he, um, he answers incorrectly, like a one-point lead in that game is really tough to come back from. And then I was, as soon as it was, like, it was game over after I got that lead. Yeah, we uh we we saw you um your the person you had left in charge of your social media released the video of you showing the uh the big list of competitions like every single competition that Big Brother Canada has ever had like right around the end of the game which actually you know they said that it was you know it was really late and they didn't mean for it to be so late but that was actually kind of perfect timing because it was right after this huge competition streak like right before you're we about to finish it off um so I I mean this was a level of preparedness that I think we've never seen before and I think I said on the uh, finale podcast that like you've you essentially solved the game of big brother canada uh can you tell us about this preparation and everything that went into this uh the the competitions yeah it was very key my preparation like i struggled strategically and socially at moments but in terms of pre-game prep mid-game studying and dominating those mental i don't think anyone's ever competed in those mental challenges like i have like i i really nailed those out of the park and kind of like i'll i'll call my game how it is but i gotta give myself props when it comes to those mental competitions so two weeks before the show starts i get the phone call you want to come play big brother canada as soon as i get that phone call in the matter of minutes i texted my friend and said can you help me her name is sue she lives in australia she kind of helps me out with my my media and stuff i said please go through every sizzling little season of big brother canada take screenshots of the competition write down what happened, how many people played, what the winner's strategy was. So I had this booklet, it was like, I called it the Big Brother Bible, of every single competition in Big Brother Canada history. And before the game, I went through every single competition, 
analyzed it, said, if this competition is this day, I will do this. And I had an optimized strategy for every single challenge. So I knew at the final five, final four, every single competition in Big Brother Canada history, it all revolves around mental. What day did this happen on? How many times did this person was on slop? You know, I just knew how important it was. So in that final five, well, the other four are, you know, just hanging out, talking, whatever. I'm in, the, I'm in my room studying my sprinkle guide because I just, like, I did, at one point production called me into the diary room. They're like, Kevin, you have to go have conversations. Like, we're making a show here. Like, stop <laughs> mm -hmm. looking at your sprinkles. But I told them, big brother, like, I've seen the game. It doesn't matter. I have to win the final four veto. I have to win the final HOH. I just need to know my days and I'm going to win this game. And so in a way, I kind of did break that end game where, like, by me being antisocial and looking at my sprinkles, I won the game. It's, it's weird. And Rob, I don't really know if you remember, I did a podcast with you during season four of Big Brother Canada where I talked about this. I, it was when Joel went out of the final five. I said, the end format to Big Brother Canada is broken and someone can beat it. I talked about this with you and I said, the, like, it relies too heavily on mental competitions. So for, I got to go back and find that clip. Right, we'll, we'll go back and look for that clip. We talked about this. So for me to go back and like <laughs> right there, beat those end competitions, it was kind of kind of hilarious. <laughs> Uh, do you do you feel like if Big Brother Canada does come back that they should probably change up the <laughs> the competitions toward the end of the game? Like well, now I think that you've this broken is what them? happened? I think they put it on hiatus to figure out until <laughs> you know, they, they, they said, "Hey, you figure out how to fix this game." Kevin yeah. Kevin Martin broke it. You got to beat the Kevin I, Martin I, factor. Huh? Snake broke another, the game. You guys figure this out. Yeah. Another <laughs> funny moment is um, so those final trivia questions, right? I went five for five. I didn't miss one. Dimitri, I think, went two for five. So we didn't even hear the last two questions. During the rap party, Trevor Boris, the production guy who, who does it, he pulls yeah. me over. We're both loaded drunk. He's like, Kevin, come here. He pulls out his phone. He has the backup questions, the questions that didn't make the final cut to go to the show. <laughs> he starts rifling them off, and I'm loaded. I answered every single one. We nailed them. All, <laughs> all of the 15, 16 questions that they made for the show, we got everyone right. So, yeah, that final yeah. three wasn't going to. Well, I just like, if Dimitri wins, he's going to cut me, right? And third place is $0. If I win, I get to take care and I win the game. $100,000 plus a sick car plus the equity of, you know, what you can do after the show as the winner of Big Brother Canada. I'm like, that final trivia game is a $200,000 trivia game. Literally, the difference between third and first is like $200,000. So, of course, I'm just going to sit in my room and study the days every single second I got. It's like the biggest moment of my life I had to execute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine you probably heard uh, this, but Trevor, uh, I, I did see that Trevor, you know, at the finale said something about the fact that, you know, production knew that if, you know, whatever Kevin said was right, like we would check our notes before <laughs> we would double check Kevin's information because we trusted him more than we trusted our own research. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How, how, much of, um, how much of those early competitions did you throw, if any? A, a lot of them. A lot of them were, um, again, I don't know what, if it was shown on the show. Um, so when Netta won that HOH, it was me, Gary, and Netta in the tiebreaker. So it was a mental competition. I was answering the questions correctly. And then after Dre went out, she was the last one I worried about. I intentionally threw the tiebreaker question. I answered over. Um, that was like day 14 or whatever. I don't remember. There was one moment that was really upset about the edit. You guys remember when I won HOH and I put Ike and Dimitri on the block and the veto is the Toyota 86. You guys remember that competition with the green signs and stuff? I mm -hmm. threw that competition, but they edited it to make it show like I lost, which really kind of hurt me and I didn't make the show. So I answered all the, I did the, I did the game as fast as I could. I did the signs, I did the puzzle. And then they're like, buzz in, buzz in, you're done. And I said, no. And I went and sat in the car for five minutes, played with the windows, played with the windshield wipers. And then I went and buzzed in. I didn't want Dimitri or Ike to leave that week. I felt like I was too big of a solo threat if one of them left. You know, we haven't talked much about the triple eviction. Uh, we talked about it in our exit interview. And then uh, you mentioned you watched the YouTube video of it. But could you just talk through the actual process of uh, realizing that that was going to be something that you were going to be faced with and then ultimately going up on the block when you thought you were safe? Yeah, w with all my prep about like twists and competitions and stuff, I really never thought that they would do a triple eviction ever again. So for me to be outgoing HOH into the triple eviction and I just, it was, this, it was literally deja vu. <laughs> Season three, I had my stuff pick HOH. I put them in the box. I said, all right, hopefully we'll see you next week. I go out in the triple eviction. Same thing. I put my stuff pick and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing a triple eviction. So I put in a lot of work that week that if it was a double eviction, I could potentially survive and that drain, you know, someone else. Would, but as soon as they announce it's a triple and I can't play, I say I have one shot in the veto to win. Um, yeah. And I don't know if they, so in that competition, you can see that I run to my ball pit 
and I gather up all my blocks first. Guys, if you ever go on Big Brother, to everyone who's listening, this is the strategy. Season three, I lost the triple eviction veto because Bruno beat me with a strategy. He went, he gathered up all his objects, then he did laps. So don't go jump in the ball pit, grab one thing, run out, jump in the ball pit. Jump in the ball pit once, get all the necessary pieces, then run laps, and yeah. So to like the win is amazing, but for me to win my veto and save myself during the triple eviction, just for myself, like I feel like my story arc was done after that competition. Like it was just such a euphoric moment. Yeah, it's a really and good then, You don't end up with a clown shoe in the corner that way, right? You're right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then two hours after that, I won the final five HOH with the drunken speeches, the number guessing game. So in the matter of three hours, I went from the final eight to the final four. It was like the craziest day. I survived the triple and then won my immunity. It was just insane to go from the final eight to the final four. So after that catastrophe happened, I was like, I could maybe win this game. Okay. Uh, I want to start to bring in, uh, we have a lot of questions for you from the listeners that we got ahead of time. And then also questions are coming in now. Hashtag RHAP. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and please, uh, Alex and Taryn continue to, uh, jump in with anything else that you guys have. Uh, this is from Yamir BB on Twitter. What was the hardest decision you made while you were playing Kevin? Uh, the hardest decision I made was probably, um, the hardest decision was when William was HOH and he put Dylan and Emily on the block and I won the veto in that brick competition. We came up with this plan to backdoor Jackie, but all along that Bruno was that during that decision, I didn't know whether to use it or not. I don't know what they showed on the show, but I was in actual turmoil in the dive room and then the bridge. I was like, lean, I actually didn't know what to do. And thankfully I made the right decision by not using it. But that was the hardest decision, the, the most agonizing. Okay. Uh, I've got a question for you. Um, and I think, you know, this is probably somewhere in the notes too, Rob. I think this is something I've seen a couple people asking. Um, obviously like, you know, Everyone knows you're, uh, you're playing poker pretty much every day. You're doing your Twitch streams and stuff like that. And, you know, playing poker at pretty high stakes, like there's, there's some high pressure moments there. And certainly I think one of the things that was most impressive, not just that you won so many competitions down the stretch, but that they were all these must win moments where, you know, it's win or go home and you pulled it through again. Like, how do you, is, is like the clutch gene, do you think that's something you can't really teach? <laughs> Or is that like something you've developed by playing at a high level in poker? Like, what do you really attribute that success to? Because you can know everything and still yeah. in the moment, I mean, we've seen plenty of people, you know, panic just because of the gravity of the situation. You're right. I mean, playing poker for, for decent amounts of money at certain moments must have trained me just to turn the emotion off and just to get the job done. I don't know if there's a clutch gene, but I do think there's a preparation gene. And I was more prepared for mental competitions in the house than, than anybody else. I knew every day. I knew everything. So so just my it calmed my mind. And just like when, as for professional poker players, it's mostly preparation. Yes, in game, you have to keep calm. You have to make decisions. The winning in professional poker comes away from the table when you're doing the studying. And I felt like the same thing for me in the Big Brother house. Me studying that HOH room and just being prepared for those mental competitions. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have a clutch gene. I think I have a preparation gene. Okay. Uh, this is a question uh, on that same subject from Matt Holtzclaw, uh, who wants to ask you, between your success and Vanessa Rousseau's relative dominance, have you guys ruined the future of poker players on Big Brother? I know uh, Matt's a poker player himself. Is, does any poker player have a chance anymore, Kevin? Uh, there's definitely going to be a stigma around you, but there's a stigma anyway. Going into season three, I lied about my profession because to the per common person in the world, poker, you think about bluffing, you think about their sunglasses, you think about, oh, this person's shady. I had a conversation with a couple days into the game. Gary comes up to me and says, why do you do a shady job? I'm like, oh, wait, poker's not shady. It's a very calculated, disciplined uh, game that you can optimize and dominate. So there's already a negative stigma, but after I won and then Vanessa, it's, but look back in Survivor, like, Poker players never did well. Anna Kate was pre-merged. She was a poker player. Jean Robert from Survivor China. He did terrible. And Garrett was pre-merged. So, I mean... Not Survivor, though. Not Big Brother. Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. Big Brother, yeah. You're going to have a stigma with poker players. But it's cool. Um, whenever a poker player is on reality television, I, I always cheer for them just based off of that. And so, it's cool to finally win the show as a poker player, for sure. Yeah, I think we nailed it. You know, Garrett's on Survivor talking about like, all I need is I need to have, be able to have a bowl of chicken and be able to have like the, the things I'm used to at the poker table. So I think maybe that's a factor. I think the <laughs> poker player is really built for Big Brother and not for Survivor. You're I right. Maybe we're on to something. The house for good, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kevin, this is a question from uh, AMSO6 on Twitter. 
Has social media reshaped the game? It seems players are more interested in followers than winning the game. Were you worried about your image? It's something that we talk about constantly on the podcast of the role that all of the social media plays in these uh, shows that we watch, uh, whether it's doing things to uh, gain a social media audience or the role social media plays, particularly on Big Brother. And uh, as somebody who has gone through it uh, so recently, yeah. What, do you have any thoughts on on this? Yeah, absolutely. From my own perspective, uh, going into season three, I wanted to be a star. I wanted to make sexy television, and like I wanted to get the camera time. And so I did a lot of antics. I was I was myself. I just turned my personality up. This time, I was less concerned about TV time. It's still nice to be on the show. It's still nice to be like a feature character, of course. But I was more concerned about the game this time. This time was more business oriented. It'd be interesting if we played Big Brother in a vacuum environment. Let's say there's no cameras at all. There's no television audience. Let's just say you're going to play Big Brother. People definitely would act differently, for sure. Yeah, a lot of people want to pan to the cameras and stuff, and. Hopefully with the Big Brother 19 cast, there's some interesting people in there, but you're right. Seeing the, you know, the Instagram models on Big Brother trying to get their followers up, it's nice to see the game moments and, and to see the game. So, How would yeah. the game be different? Would it be, would it be more cutthroat because you wouldn't be worried about what people were going to say on social media? Yes. Yeah. You didn't have to watch your language. You didn't have to. It would be way more cutthroat. You could be a villain. People are always scared about being the villain. Like I, I was terrified about being the villain. Other people don't want to be the villain. It takes a rare person. I love on reality TV when someone can be the villain and own it. And is like, yes, I always cheer for the villain. Um, but you're right. If there's no cameras, it would be way more cutthroat. The things people would say would be way more vile. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that the key to being able to own that is in the diary room where you're able to have that relationship with the audience and be able to, uh, you know, g g describe, you know, exactly what you're able to do. Uh, I, I think that, Kevin, that's something that you've uh, done well in sort of like uh, fostering uh, a, a relationship with the audience in your diary room. Uh, along the way in your seasons where uh, we, Taryn and I just finished uh, writing or working on our audio book. We went back and watched Big Brother 2 and really nice. uh, Will Kirby, we, you know, give so much credit to as being like the ultimate person to be able to be able to go into the diary room and have that relationship one on one with the audience where he could do terrible things in the house, but you still felt like he was your friend. Yeah, for sure. The diary, like when you go in the diary room, you can't take it off. The diary room is one of the more key parts of the game. And I was super aware of that all the time. So I hope I formed that audience. Again, I haven't seen any of my diary rooms, so it'll be interesting to see what they, they showed. But at the same time, I was super aware that the first half of the game, I was a minor character, almost invisible on the show. Based on how often people get called to the diary room, their line of questioning, production saying, hey, da 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 da. Like the first half of the game, I didn't win a competition. I was never nominated, so I didn't get a lot of screen time. But I was fine with that. That proves that I was kind of playing an under, under the radar game. But you nailed it, Rob. Having that relationship with the audience, especially in the Canadian version where twists often happen, is very important. Colleen has a question, uh, wants to know, did it help or hinder your game when William left the house? I did feel like that that was a, uh, a big help to you in terms of, and maybe it's a little bit of uh, looking at it uh, from a, a different point of view, that William went out in the triple eviction also. Because it, it really, in some, in some ways, uh, sort of, that you weren't a pair anymore. Yes. And while, yeah, it would have been another number on your side, uh, it was able to sort of like you had to, you know, you had a singular focus of what you had to do at that point rather than try to uh, make it work with a, a pair of you and William. You're right. I'm yeah, I I think it, w it was a, g a good a good moment, which sucks because I really like William. But him leaving definitely was kind of like a fresh start. It gave me more time to, again, study more and get in the right mindset. And and because, yeah, when I, I spent so much time with William, it probably took away from my other relationships. But I agree, especially in the triple eviction. So William wasn't on the block. There wasn't that process of campaigning and stuff. It was just clean. It was cut. And I had a fresh start at the final five. So absolutely, it definitely helped my game. But it, w it was sad to see him go. Uh, Edmo wants to know if Ike and Dimitri were in the final two, who would you have voted for? At the time, without seeing or hearing anything in the moment, I know I would have voted for Ika. So if okay. Dimitri, so if I get third place, I sweep away to the final stage, vote for Ika or Dimitri. 
I would have voted for Ika over Dimitri. I just, I, 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 her impressive dominance of the social game and, and being able to make people do whatever she wanted at certain moments was just more impressive. Like the comp wins is important, especially coming from a huge comp winner. Like, I mean, but what's more impressive? Dimitri knocking down bowling balls and throwing bean bags in a circle or Ika actually controlling the social manipulation of the game. For me, it's Ika. Okay. I have and a do voicemail. Think, do you think Ika wins? No. No, Ika rubbed too many people the wrong way. She wasn't going to get the Jackie vote. She wasn't going to get the Netta vote. So Ika, while dominating moments in the game, her general, how she send, how she, she sent people off to jury in a really negative way. Her goodbye messages, everything was negative. No, Ika, Ika probably wasn't going to win in a lot of situations. She'd lose to Dimitri. Yes, Dimitri would have won, I believe. Okay. Uh, Big Brother Ant in the chat room says, uh, do you think... Please be honest that the jury was bitter. Was, was this a bitter jury? I talked to Karen the day after the finale. She said, yes, this was a bitter jury, uh, that they, uh, they were bitter. Do you feel like that this was in any way a bitter jury? Uh, I mean, again, such a general term. I mean, we, w- we would have seen if it was like Ika versus Dimitri, Ika versus Karen. If they would have flipped the vote and given Karen the win over Ika, that would have been the definition of a, a bitter jury for sure. But me versus Karen, there's no, there's no proof. Like, I, I, I played a, a better game than, than Karen, you know. I, I don't think it was as bitter and as Karen. And not to take game. anything away from Karen. Yeah, but, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, like, depending on whatever metric uh, you want to take a look at, I guess that uh, you were nominated more times than she was. I, I mean, not- I mean, uh, but I mean, if you're going to, like, try to take a look at this, like, analytically, uh, yeah. I-, I feel like the, you know, history is on your side. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, not to take anything, oh, anything away for, for Karen. She definitely did some cool things in there. Um, oh, what was the point I was going to make? There was one thing that is slipping my mind here. Anyway, sorry, it, it, it's gone. That's okay. Uh, I have a voicemail question for you from one of our listeners. This is one of our listeners. Jeff has a question for you. Would you rather fight a giant mosquito one time and get your ass whipped by yeah. it? Or would you like the relationship that you have and never get bit again? Or do you like the relationship that you have with mosquitoes right now? Well, what would your answer to that question be? Is that Jeff from American? <laughs> From the American U.S.? Yeah. <laughs> hey, don't dodge the question, Kevin. Uh, what, would you rather f- get your ass beat by a giant mosquito or would you rather keep the relationship you currently have with mosquitoes? <laughs> what is that clip from? Where is that? That can't be a real question. I would, oh, it's get, a real my question. Ass, I would yeah. get my ass beat by a giant mosquito, I guess. <laughs> New house guest icebreaker. <laughs> what was that atrocity? <laughs> it's the the pre the pregame interviews for Big Brother uh, nineteen. Yeah, Jeff, 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 Jeff is really reinventing the way the pregame interview is played. Jeff's yeah. never been like the most standout interviewer ever, has he? No, no, he's breaking new ground. Uh, I, yeah, I disagree. I think Jeff is the most standout interviewer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with questions like these. Well, while we're yeah. on this subject, Kevin, do you have any thoughts on the the cast that just came out? Do you, I, if you, you've glanced over it, right? Uh, I have, I have glanced over it. It's interesting. I like that the average age is up. Like they got a couple yeah. more, uh, more interesting people. It's a very diverse cast, and you know, I'll, I don't think I'm going to be watching every episode so closely, but I always follow on Reddit Big Brother. I'm always every day I'm on Reddit Big Brother, and I, I'll, I get the the theme of the story, so it's going to be interesting. I like all new cast, older average age. It could be like you know a legendary season in the making. Okay, a uh, question from Mr. Robot Taryn uh, wants to know that Cindy denies that Brevin fought for Netta to stay, but we saw otherwise. Arissa tweeted they had the receipts. Uh, from Kev's perspective, what happened in the double eviction? So when we saw on the show in the jury segment, when Bruno got to the jury house, uh, Cindy was really upset with Bruno because Bruno did not, uh, you know, uh, oh. that he, she felt like that if it, was, if it wasn't for you guys, then she wouldn't have put up uh, Netta she really, on the block. You really blamed putting Netta up on me and Bruno. I, I, <laughs> yes. No way. Like that kid. Oh, what? I mean, <laughs> so Cindy makes a big move. She should just, she should, just, first of all, just own it instead of passing off the blame. But if you're going to pass off the blame to other people, Pass it off to the correct people. Like Bruno and I were the only two people who even said anything against putting Netta up. So Sydney's upstairs, production's saying, come downstairs, come downstairs. I run upstairs. I say, like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? I very again, to addition to my game, I very passively say, like, th- like this isn't a good idea. Like, do something else, but it's your Not decision. Good. 
way too passive by me. Then Bruno comes running up the stairs and I say, Bruno, talk to her, talk to her. And Bruno's way more aggressive, says like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Bruno was the more outspoken of the two. But again, we both should have been more aggressive for sure. But yeah, I was, I was shocked that, because uh, it's on tape. Like, how can you deny that? Right? I, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> uh, we just that we it's an unknown mystery yeah okay well you'll 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 enjoy that when you get up to that part uh gregory mcbean wants to ask you uh, did you take anything from sarah hanlon's game and use it in your winning season we talk uh all the time with returning players that uh often we identify something that a returning player brought back into their uh season in their second season from the person that won, we saw it most recently uh, with Sarah Lacina yeah. in Survivor Game Changers. Was there anything from Sarah Hanlon that uh, she did that you felt like that you were going to try to incorporate into your game this time? Yeah, Sarah was, I think, one of the best social players ever in Big Brother Canada. Her relationships across the board were just so amazing. And even post-game show, everyone loves Sarah Hanlon. She's incredible. I definitely tried. I definitely failed with some relationships for sure. But that's an interesting thing that when returning players come back, they often try to emulate. The, that is an interesting theory, um, Matt. I like Survivor Game Changers. I, the community is not really big on it. Anyway, it's a side note. I could talk about Survivor all day. I tried to emulate what Sarah did a lot of the times with relationships. She was always super kind, but she did confront people when she needed to. Um, yeah, I, I think Sarah's a very underrated winner. I know, Taryn, you're not big on the Sarah Hanlon game, but I respectfully <laughs> disagree. That's the, the one area that he's, uh, that he's wrong on. <laughs> Oh, yeah, please oh forgive that I'm wrong. Please, please, you know please forgive him. You know what's an also interesting theory is like if returning players come from the same season, do they work together? And often the answer is yes. Like Sarah and Tony and Survivor, um, me and Bruno didn't get along in season three, but it's just like you, like the devil you know in the Big Brother house is better than the devil you don't know. Like we instantly knew each other were going to work together. I'm shocked. I that knew I, the devil in the Big Brother house, and it was Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, Karen, Karen Singbeal. <laughs> uh, Kenneth wants to know, uh, Kenneth Jackson, uh, do you still talk to Karen? Do you guys have a relationship? Yeah, we send we send snaps and uh, and texts all over the place. Yeah, she's out at the shoe swap, living in her nice cabin. It's good. Yeah, we, we're we're snapping all the time. She's she's fun. The yeah. occasional Kenneth, snake emoji. Yeah, I just want to say that whether you're against each other, getting to the final five, final four, final three is so difficult that even if you are enemies with the other person, there is a unique form of bonding that does happen. You know, going to the Big Brother Canada Awards at the final four, doing the final three, it's even though you're against each other, getting that deep in a very difficult game does bond people together. And I did experience that with Karen and Ike, even though we were against each other for a majority of the season. Dimitri and I were always chill with each other. You know, we're just, ah, we're cool. Yeah, I was I was saying during the season that uh, I felt like your relationship with Karen was going to be like Dan's relationship with Jerry in season ten, and that like someday Karen will be at your wedding and it'll be great. Oh, absolutely, yeah, <laughs> for sure. She invited me out to to her cabin. I got to go, you know, wakeboarding with her or something. Wakeboarding, wow! <laughs> nice. uh, I, I love Karen. Also, I think that she was so funny on. Oh, uh, so season. funny! Yeah. Uh, I did. I really think that this was a very fun uh, group that got to the end on this season, and uh, all of you guys uh, brought something to the table. Yeah, the final four between Demika and Karen and myself was definitely a unique group. It's kind of I was very proud of you know how the season turned out, and I think people were really high on it, which is really nice. It was cool to be a part of. Okay, uh, this is from uh, Sober Hyena on Twitter. Kevin, how does it feel to be one of the only two people besides Dan Geesling to win Big Brother unanimously? Yeah, the unanimous vote was very, very cool. I, I wasn't too worried about a legacy or, or anything. I just kind of wanted to win. But to get 9-0 uh, was huge. I didn't think I would get Dylan's vote. I thought it would maybe be a 7-2-8-1. But credit to Dylan. Thank you very much for, for the vote and the 9-0. It shows that he was a really good sport about it. So, yeah, 9-0 is pretty, pretty, pretty sexy sweet. Okay. Uh, Mr. Robot Taron, was, was the Peasants Alliance real for you? Why did you throw out Jackie's name to Demica? Uh, she exposed the alliance to Demica after. Yeah, so in that moment, it was final nine. Bruno and I went through our list of people about potentially people we could work with. Ike and Dimitri, not happening. Karen, not happening. Dylan, no. Nah. Like, we went through the list of people, and it was just no, 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 no. And the last name we mentioned, Jackie. Do you know what? We could maybe work with Jackie. So we went and made an alliance. If 
Jackie Dimitri, or if the three of us, Jackie, Bruno, or myself won power, we could have maybe stayed together. But as soon as the other group wins power, we have to throw Jackie under the bus. I feel like, you know, in, there's different sections of the house, and our section didn't win power, so they are going to attack our section. So then it's like, all right, we have to make sure it isn't me or Bruno. And we tried something with Jackie. It didn't work because Bruno and I got on the block. It would have been crazy to, to put anyone else but, but me and Bruno on the block. So, yeah, I mean, it was – Real for convenience. And as soon as it wasn't convenient, I was out. And that's how I worked in the Big Brother house. I know it's super shady. I had no loyalty to anybody. I will be with you for convenience. And then as soon as it's not convenient for my game, I'm just going to leave. Right. Well, that's the idea, right, behind bringing yeah. in someone like a Jackie is that it gives someone who's targeting you and your group another place to go. It gives you something to sell as opposed to a nothing that you had before. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it, it was a weak pitch we had to try. Yeah. And, and it's, it's weird, too, because people found you so like such a mystery and enigma. They couldn't predict what you were doing. But I think that like in a lot of ways, you can be a very reliably predictable player because you will always do what's you in what you perceive as your own best interest. Whereas, you know, somebody like Karen, that is absolutely not the case. Yeah. Um, so but but people just weren't able to see that in the house. They couldn't see that. Like, that's what you cared about. They they really just couldn't understand you. Yeah. Yeah, I was, was a giant mystery to a lot of people, which again, it's like not a good trait to have. You want to be very open. You want to be your perception of you as a player. You want to be open, honest, straight to the point. I was kind of an enigma. I was a mystery, which is really upsetting. I couldn't change that perception. But you're right, Taryn. I'm very predictable in the sense that I'm always going to make the best decision for me. Always. Okay. Edwin Johnson wants to know, how do you like your new blank from the brick? Have you gone and visited Mike Bell yet, Kevin? Oh, my God, Mike Bell. It was funny. So <laughs> I actually went to production, and I was dead serious. I was like, if we ever have a family visit, you're like, like, can you send Mike Bell in for me? I thought that would have been a hilarious scene. Mike Bell walks through the front door. I cry Kevin in his arms. <laughs> like, and I was like, if I went HOH, like, Get the video message from Mike Bell. Forget my mom. Forget my forget Peely. Like I would love to see them. I want to hear from Mike Bell. They didn't think it was as funny as I thought it was. But um, oh yeah, seeing Mike Bell was like a dream come true. But I haven't gone to the brick. I have a lot of money to the brick. I just talked to my family. I was like, you guys need anything? Get anything? Because okay. I just I I move all over the world, so I don't need furniture. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually do need a new TV. I saw that in the chat of your yeah. Twitch stream. What's, what size What size do you want, Taryn? Let me write it down here. <laughs> Let's go over 60 inches. We're, Add we're it good. to the list. <laughs> Kevin, uh, you said that you uh, could talk about Survivor for uh, forever. Did you finish watching Survivor Game Changers? Did you get through that? Yeah, I did. I, I binged it. And now I'm going back and listening to the Survivor know-it-alls. Uh, you guys did awesome. I, I love Steven as always. Um, I did finish it. Yeah, a lot of people were down on the season. I saw the rankings on Survivor Reddit, a lot of people were dying. I thought it was like an average season, maybe even like slightly above average in my mind. I thought Sarah Lucina was a good winner. I know people didn't like her as a narrator. Sarah definitely played that Tony S game. No, it was a good season. It was a little bit crazy. The editing in certain moments of the season was was awful. It was mm -hmm. there's some bad editing from the Survivor. Like what? This year. what? What do you say? What do you uh, feel like? I mean, when Michaela editing. went home at what the final seven, there it was yeah. like, where did that come from? There was no Michaela storyline, and all of a sudden she's gone, like an unfinished character. But big moves. And to see Sari go home at the final six, based on a million twists, was kind of hard to see as well. Sari was such a legend. Also, like I'm, I'm not a huge Sandra fan. I'm, I've always been lower uh -huh. on the Sandra stock than other people. But like seeing her go home and get her torch now for the first time did hurt me a little bit. So it was a fun okay. season. So you, you came back on Sandra. Oh yeah, yeah. I, she, she, I like her third appearance. I I think is slightly more impressive than her first two wins in a very weird way. Like, but yeah, okay, yeah. People said that that was that was the thing. Yeah, I get yeah. that. Uh, uh, that Tara, Alex, do you have any other questions for Kevin today? Uh, I can't think of anything. This was pretty comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Where, where, can, where can people find you on Twitch, Kevin? Uh, yeah. Twitch. I can Google Kevin Martin Twitch Poker. Kevin, that Kevin Martin Twitch Poker. It was funny that my middle name is more popular than, oh, my God. Like, Karen really branded that Kevin Robert Martin, did she? She really, really did. <laughs> yeah, that, that helped. It's really helped. helped me out. Yeah. 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 Kevin, when you and I first uh, spoke uh, outside of uh, Big Brother, I, I remember that we that we spoke right after your season in Big Brother Canada three. That uh, did I did I say anything that was helpful at that time, or did I give you more bad advice like I tend to give people? No, your advice was you're just like man. 
like in my mind when the first time you <laughs> no you, you kind of call me because in the first time you play a reality tv show you kind of think it bigger than it is you know like this is life-changing this is my clinical moment in life like this is everything and i phoned you rob and you're just like eh, like you played on a reality tv show like you'll do okay and i was like oh like that was a lot less than i thought it was good advice though it was like just like take it as it goes you know yeah Good. I, that, uh, hopefully that set you on the trajectory to, uh, to where you are now. But in all seriousness, you know, winning Big Brother is great, but I'm, I'm really uh, I, I, even more proud of uh, what you've been able to do uh, with your uh, poker streaming because, you know, uh, like there's uh, so much variance that goes into these uh, reality show games and, uh, you know, a bounce of the ball one way or the other. But uh, what you're doing outside the Big Brother house, uh, I know how much hard work that takes to uh, get to uh, where you are now. So uh, really, uh, job, job so well much. done with everything, Kevin. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I'm excited to get back and link up with your, your buddy, Jason Somerville, Rob. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. going to go down to the World Series of Poker in a couple weeks here and play a few events and, and hang out with Jason Somerville and the crew. So yeah, this has been a, a fun interview. I hope, I hope I covered everything. Yeah, uh, hopefully uh, I see you in Reno again uh, later this year. Hopefully that uh, we can wor uh, that'll work out. When we were in Reno last year, it was uh, me and you. Uh, we had dinner with uh, with Boston Rob and Tyson yeah. and Anna Kate. Uh, we did credit card roulette. Uh, were you lucky that night, Kevin? No, I didn't. I lose. Didn't I have to pay for that bill that night? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I definitely paid for Rob and Tyson's <laughs> supper that night. And it was. It was foreshadowing for the money you yeah. were about to win. Yeah, yeah. Tyson, Tyson ran around the casino playing slot machines. Hey, too. look, you pay for dinner for enough Survivor winners, and then uh, you get you that some of that uh, Boston Robin Tyson karma rubs off on you. Rubs off. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> winners <laughs> club. Yeah, that was good. Cool. I think also Anna Kate, uh, her credit card number was uh, they got snapped uh, in people recording that, and then people had to like uh, like, hey, oh, your, yeah. your <laughs> credit card number is <laughs> on Snapchat right now. That's right. Okay. Yeah, it was a fun night. All right. Uh, do we have a hashtag for the Kevin Martin interview? That Kevin Martin. That, that Kevin Martin. That Kevin Martin. Okay. That Kevin Martin slash. As opposed to the other one. Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, there you go. All right. Well, great job. Uh, thanks everybody who uh, joined us live here today, Kevin. Anything else you want to uh, tell people to uh, to check out or anything like that? Yeah. If you guys like poker, even if you're not a poker fan, I I try to do a Twitch stream. That's pretty. Uh, pretty chill and pretty enjoyable so follow me on twitter or, or come come chat uh come catch a twitch stream i'm gonna fire up some tables and get gambling here in a little bit so i'm excited okay all right uh everybody uh thanks for checking this out uh taryn any word on uh when the lfc are getting together for the draft uh we're hoping it's uh sunday at 4 p.m eastern okay tentative sunday 4 p.m eastern uh be yes. on the lookout for that yes. follow taryn on twitter at taryn armstrong or at armstrong taryn uh and at alex kidwell and of course if you want to check out me and taryn talking 19 hours plus about dr will and big brother 2 kevin doesn't seem like something you want to jump right into 19 hour audiobook from uh, See, me and taryn per uh talking about wanna, old seasons of big brother i want to jump into the Stephen rob like evolution of survivor i'm going to go through the okay. old seasons of survivor so that's what i'll be doing and well that's not with steven though i know that steven's your favorite oh yeah that's josh josh wiggler yeah, yeah okay so I will, i'll get into those but after playing 69 days of big brother i'm going to take a slight pause from the community okay. and just get away for a little bit but, but right, i'll you're be following mistake. along with big brother 19 all right again all right. you don't have to remember the day count kevin it's fine you're I'm good. telling you, it's so ingrained. I'm starting to forget it a little bit, but like, like it's no. I'm, I keep telling myself, like, I don't have to. Like, Ika's chip being pulled seven times no longer has reference. To, like, is no longer important <laughs> in my life, right? For that time, it was the most important thing for my life for those three weeks. But now it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. I don't want to see crazy. sprinkles ever You'll again. You'll be ninety still talking about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just gotta like visualize all that as baggage and like just drop it. Exactly. Right? That's, like, that's the challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's like there's still like a part of you that's like, well, I might need this someday. Like, I just, I need to retain this. Like, what if you go back and they're like, on Big Brother Canada Five? <laughs> no, no, we're ret we're retired. Our our short and ridiculous reality TV career is. Maybe is you're a hoarder. Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> Let all that stuff go. Yeah. Uh, it's too information funny. hoarder yeah. okay all right uh thanks so much everybody for checking it out uh if you missed any of our big brother us preview all these last two nights those are available as well on our itunes feed rob is website.com slash itunes or on rob is website.com take care everybody have a good one bye bye, bye.